Okay, okay, okay. Let's see. Yep, we're ready to get the show on the road. Well, hidey, hidey, ho there, happy innovators. How y'all doing, huh? You hanging in there? You having a good week? You getting all your stuff done? Are you enjoying yourself at least a little bit, maybe? Maybe, okay, maybe. You know, I gotta say, it's been a while since my last podcast, and I was so anxious. I was like, there is no way, like, it is untenable, okay, for me to get to the end of the day today and not do a new podcast. So here I am. And, you know, I gotta tell you, over the past few years or so, I've done a couple of podcasts where I talked about the band U2, and, you know, I'm a huge fan of U2. Everybody that knows me, knows that um you know i pretty much could tell you anything there is to know about the band Uh, i have every album they've ever made a lot of imports and all that kind of stuff and i'm you know a strong fan a supporter i've been to several concerts and all that stuff and if you've been listening to my podcast over the past few years you've kind of heard me especially lately i've been a little critical of the band and the music that they've been putting out lately okay um but i gotta say okay i feel kind of bad about that because i really do enjoy their music a lot okay and they've had a lot of impact on me uh you know as an artist as a musician like there would be no me without them you know so there's this part of me i guess that i wanted to talk about today where it's like okay yeah their past couple albums or so haven't been so great in my book okay they've been flops i mean let's face it okay that's that's how i see it but there's this part of me deep down inside that's kind of hoping you know, like waiting and hoping that the new U2 album, like the next one that they release, is going to like blow me away. You know, it'll just be amazing. And like a, you know, like a seminal uh, release in their catalog. Like it'll just change everything, you know, and just blow everybody away. Like just great artistic, creative, amazing sonic experiences, you know? And, uh, you know, maybe that's wishful thinking or whatever, but I did want to talk about that, you know? That there's a part of me that holds out hope, you know? That it's not gonna suck. Like, the next U2 album is going to really impress me, you know? And all their fans, and it's gonna be... You know, uh, you know, like a clarion call. Like they are, they are still fresh and they are still going. I doubt that'll happen. Okay, I honestly doubt that that will be the case. But deep down inside, I'm hoping for that. And I just wanted to mention that before I got the podcast going today. Okay, so there you go. There's a part of me. Maybe there's a part of you that's like that too, where you know. That you know, the, something is going to have a bad outcome, but there's a part of you that holds out hope that it won't go so bad, you know. And if you're like me, usually, you know, uh, you know, for me anyway, I, I I go to the worst possible outcome, you know, and then usually in reality, it's nowhere near that, or it's somewhere in between good and bad, you know. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. You probably do. It's a universal, I think, anyway, or I would guess, anyway. It's probably a universal uh, human experience, you know, that we we hold out hope for the positive outcome, you know. And um, so I just wanted to mention that. And I also wanted to mention that uh, over the past, you know, couple years, few years or whatever, I had talked about this YouTuber... Uh, a character named Rob Skiba, who was doing the whole flat earth thing and uh, just a really interesting guy, like an interesting person. And, um, 
you know, whether you agree with him or not, which sometimes I did and sometimes I didn't. I didn't always agree with what he was talking about or whatever. But nevertheless, he was still, uh, you know, a very interesting character and, um, you know, intuitive and informative and um, at least, you know, trying to be fair, I believe, you know, his his position was um, open and fair and um, well researched. You know, he was he was pretty pretty good guy. Well, unfortunately, I just found out that about a week ago or maybe two weeks ago now, um, Rob Skiba died. He passed away. He was only like 52 years old, uh, which is you know kind of relatively young, you know. And uh, apparently, the well, they're saying anyway that he died from COVID, and uh, which is interesting because prior to this, you know, maybe over the past six months or the past year, he's been a uh, you know extremely harsh critic of the vaccinations and an anti-vaxer, you know. So um, the irony being that this guy who's a famous anti-vaxxer, supposedly has died from COVID. And that's tragic, you know, really. Regardless of how he died, it's tragic because, at least for me anyway, you know, I, I really kind of had it in my head that I would be hearing new ideas and new things from this guy, you know, for years to come. I, I had no reason to think that that wouldn't be the case, but... You know, there's no predicting anything like that. And unfortunately, he's no longer here. And um, yeah, it makes me feel kind of sad. You know, I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's, it's always sad when someone dies, but it's a particularly sad thing when somebody who uh, you admire and somebody that you pay attention to uh, is no longer around anymore. I mean... Uh, even if I never agreed with anything he said, he was still, if not anything else, he was entertaining. And that's really what it's about to me. You know, you know, you just when you're putting yourself out like somebody like Rob Skiba or somebody like me, even, you know, or maybe you do it as well. It's like you kind of, you know. You're putting yourself out there. It's it's entertainment. You're you're putting yourself in the public space, and the idea is to hopefully entertain somebody. You know, somebody will hear it, and uh, whatever. And uh, you know, I don't know. It's a sad time for me. I gotta be honest. It really is. I feel really bad that Rob Skiba, you know, ha- has died. He's not around anymore, and. I won't even get into the whole circumstances surrounding his, you know, mysterious death because it's pretty weird. I think it is anyway. But the fact of the matter is, is that he's no longer here anymore and I feel bad. You know? I mean, he was getting a lot of uh, flack, you know, from uh, the social media platforms. I mean, he was getting banned and shadow banned and blocked and cut off and canceled, you know, all because he had talked about the flat earth maybe too much, or maybe he was too convincing or something. I don't know. But um, there seems to be a lot of that happening now. Um, You know, a lot of people leaving YouTube and a lot of people leaving the social media platforms that, you know, are, have become, you know, a staple of, culture really all over the world i mean i i do see a slow and gradual migration taking place like people are leaving those platforms that are canceling them or shadow banning them or censoring their speech or whatever um so like i kind of predicted that i think a couple years ago, you know, talking about the whole YouTube thing and how if they kept censoring everybody that they wouldn't be able to last, you know, it won't be able to stay that way forever because eventually people are going to get tired of having to watch what they say all the time and talk around different topics or whatever. And 
You know, it's just a matter of somebody else coming up with another idea like YouTube or like Twitter or like uh, Facebook, you know, based on that kind of idea and, uh, you know, start a new thing and people will, you know, migrate over. And I think, I think that that's starting to happen uh, with Rumble. I think that Rumble is starting to slowly take the place start or or no okay rumble is slowly starting to become a refuge for people who do not want their speech censored they want to be able to talk freely and openly and um it's kind of an amazing thing to watch and we lived in a very very interesting time where things like that can happen and it is happening Okay, and enough so where I'm kind of starting to think that, you know, maybe I should consider the same. You know, there, like, there may be a day that comes when I'm no longer available on YouTube. You know, not by my choice, but by somebody else's. That could happen. You know, I've already been canceled on Twitter and, you know, for talking about what? music and I guess I mentioned vaccines and stuff but or I don't I talked about Donald Trump I talked about Biden I've talked about everything you know because I believe that I'm free to talk about whatever I want apparently that's not the case at least for certain social media platforms and oh well you know um, which reminds me of that whole Dave Chappelle controversy that's going on right now I mean I don't even know what to think about that it's so fascinating to me what we're watching you know what what's emerging out of our culture you know out of this culture of canceling people and censorship and all this trying to control you know this the way that people speak and what people say you know and you have somebody like Dave Chappelle who I don't know if you're aware of this or not, so I guess I can tell you really quick that, you know, he recently did some kind of special where he had some pretty challenging kind of ideas, you know, and he was kind of speaking freely and openly, knowing full well that he was going to get the smackdown, you know, from somebody, and he didn't care. Out of all the comedians that are out there, you know, doing that kind of thing. He's the only one that had the balls to actually start, you know, challenging that idea of, you know, controlled speech, compelled speech. Like he is the only one. Everybody else kind of chickened out, you know? And uh, think about that. And I don't know if you've had a chance to check any of that out or if you've heard about it or you've watched anything about it but it's so fascinating this time we live in um i predict that in the future uh, we'll start seeing a lot more of that once people kind of get comfortable uh, or they or they have the opportunity to watch somebody like dave chappelle do it first and they become comfortable with the idea then you'll start seeing a lot more of that you know challenge emerging from people who just don't want to be told what to say or what not to say you know they just don't want that um it's very very interesting to me you know so anyway how are you guys doing huh got your cup of coffee i got a cup right here i'm gonna take a sip so hang on I got a cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee today. A little to-go cup. That sippy top thing. I dig it. It's pretty good. Hang on. Oh, man. Anyway. You know, I'm an active dreamer. You know, when I sleep, I have a lot of, you know, vivid dreams. A lot of, you know, intense dream experiences, you know, when I sleep. Maybe you're the same way, you know? Lately, okay, I've been having dreams 
like a series of dreams about this girl that I used to date a long time ago. I dated her for a long time. And a lot of people thought that we were probably going to get married. That's how long we dated. It's like five years. But I've been having dreams about her. And I don't know if I should like try to reach out to her and see if she's okay. You know, like there's something in these dreams that's kind of telling me, okay, that she's in some kind of trouble or some kind of danger. And I'm kind of wrestling with this idea, you know, of, of like, should I, you know, reach out to her? This is somebody that I haven't spoken to in, man, probably at least 30 years, you know, like we're not friends anymore. You know, she went her way. I went mine. Life took us in different directions. And, um, you know, I really kind of don't know too much about her anymore. I don't know really where she's at or what she's doing or anything. I don't even know if she's still alive, you know? And, um, I, you know, I've been talking to my wife about it. And she, my wife is like telling me, you should call her. You know, you should try to reach out to her and see if she's okay. You know, like maybe there's a reason why, you know, I'm having these dreams and um, you know, why she's kind of reemerging in my psyche. You know, and uh, I guess, you know, when you when you're with somebody for a really, really long time, especially when you're younger, which I was, um, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of you're bound to that person, you know, uh, in some way. OK, so, yeah, we weren't married. Um, we were never even engaged or anything like that. And we might have talked about marriage or something, but obviously that never, you know, came into fruition or anything. So, like, after time goes by, um, you know, even though we're not connected anymore, I still do have affection for her. You know, um, I'm not in love with her, but I love her. And I care for her and I don't want anything bad to ever happen to her, you know. Um, do you know what I mean? It's like, I guess like with any other friend from your past, especially uh, people that you cared a great deal about, even if things went really bad towards the end of that relationship. Like when you think back on them or when you remember them, you know, especially with the passage of time. Uh, at least from my experience anyway, you tend to like remember the good things, you know, you tend to kind of like forget a lot of the negative things you know, that happens over time, not right away, you know, but after a good 20 or 30 years, when you look back on, you know, the stupidity of your childhood or your youth, you know, the, the stupid mistakes you made or the stupid people that you were friends with or you know, just the things you did that kids do, you know, the dumb things um, and the dumb people and all that stuff. You go back in your mind and over the years, the negative stuff just kind of falls away, you know, like, you know, you reach a certain age where it's like, who wants to play the blame game? Like, I don't give a shit about that, you know, um, I just I just care about the people. You know, and I remember the good things. At least I, I try to, too. But I, I think naturally it happens. I, I have a theory about that, you know, and I've, I've thought that way for a long time. But, oh, maybe over the past year, it's really kind of been honed down to a, like a concise, like thought, you know, that um, that's like a test of whether you really loved someone or not. Uh, maybe. OK, maybe like uh, when you think back on the people that you loved at one time and you went your separate ways, like when you think about them, if your first thoughts are negative, then you probably didn't really, especially after like 30 years, like when you look back and think about them, if your thoughts are negative, you probably didn't really love them that much. 
But when you think about somebody that you loved a long time ago, like 30 years later, and the first thoughts that come to your mind are happy memories and positive things, even though there were, you know, scads of bad experiences with that person, okay, time allows them the freedom and the pardon you know like i you know that that that's how i feel anyway and that's how i gauge whether i really truly love someone or not and um yes i'm married yes i love my wife i've you know i will never be unfaithful to my wife okay that won't ever happen i know they say never say never but it won't happen it just won't happen it's a long story but it won't happen but you know I still do care for this girl that I used to date. And um, when I think about her now, even though there was a lot of bad things that happened between us towards the end especially, I don't care anymore about that stuff. You know, let it go. It doesn't matter anymore. We were kids. We were stupid. You know? And uh, we both have the luxury of hindsight, you know, 30 years of life of, uh, you know, good and bad. You know, you look back on these things and, you know, they say, I guess, absence makes the heart grow fonder. You know, that's like a cliche, but it's kind of like, well, I guess it's kind of like that, but really it's more, it's more than that. You know, I guess maybe that is a question, though, isn't it? Like, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we uh, pardon the people from our past? The ones that we really cared about. And maybe, okay, maybe the ones that really hurt us a lot. You know, like they crushed us, you know, emotionally or whatever. Just broke our hearts. But we really did love them. And that's why they broke our heart, right? Shouldn't we allow them the luxury of a pardon for that. And just, you know, if you were to see them again or talk to them again, come at them with open arms, you know? And if they burn you again, like if they do something again, like now, it's on them, you know? I don't know, maybe I'm stupid for thinking that way and maybe it's, you know, Pollyannish or something or pie in the sky thinking. You know, but uh, I don't know. Maybe that's a, a broader question for everybody. You know, like, shouldn't we allow forgiveness for everybody? You know, forgiveness, it's such a basic, simple thing. You know, it's not a difficult thing to do to forgive someone, especially like after time has passed. Like, who cares? You know, I don't. I don't. I never had a problem forgiving people, you know, unconditionally, you know, especially, especially if they apologize. I know I've talked about that before, that all you really have to do, like if you burn me, or you do something against me or something, you do something that hurts me, really all you have to do is apologize, you know, a sincere apology, and we'll never have to even think about it again. You know, unconditional forgiveness. You know, a lot of the time when people have done bad things to me, I forgave them immediately. I may not talk to them ever again, <laughs> okay, because I'm not stupid, but I forgave them. You know, I don't carry that around with me. I don't carry that kind of resentment and hatred with me. It's a waste of energy and thought. You know, think about that, you know. Especially now, in popular culture, there's so much hatred, you know, vitriol. Like, people just are so nasty a lot of the time to each other. A lot of the time, they're strangers, and they're just, they're so rude or so disrespectful or, you know, unforgiving. And, you know, if you want to be forgiven for being stupid, because we're all stupid, you know, Let's not kid ourselves. I mean, we all are capable of making huge mistakes, you know? And if you want to be forgiven for those kinds of things, then you have to be willing to forgive people yourself, 
you know? And that's, to me anyway, it seems like it's just going the way of the dodo bird, man. Like, people are just not willing to forgive the next person, the person next to them, you know? As if we're owed something or something like that, you know? It's like, no. Let's kind of, instead of trying to recognize, you know, the wrong that's being done to you or to me or whoever, right? Uh, let's try to recognize the positive things or maybe, maybe the times that we've done the exact same thing to someone else. You know, we made a mistake. We did a stupid thing. You know, regretful behavior. You know, allow me to be forgiven for that. And if I expect to be forgiven, I have to be willing to forgive you as well. Maybe a little mutual respect, you know, will take us all into the future in a much more content and happier way. Don't you think? It's been lost. I think it's been lost. And uh, it'll make its way back, I'm sure. You know, this too shall pass. But this culture of non-forgiveness, you know, and, you know, finding somebody's, you know, flaws, the things they say or do wrong, as if you don't do that yourself, you know, as if you're incapable or impervious to, you know, wrongful behavior, you know, come on. Do you know what I'm talking about? You do. I know you do. I know you do. If you're breathing, you're living right now, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, you know, that goes along with what I was saying about Dave Chappelle. You know, even somebody like him who steps up and, you know, I guess maybe it's his job, you know, his obligation, right, to challenge the things that he stands against, you know. And I don't think that he stands against like any particular community of people. I think he stands against behavior from certain people. And there's a difference, you know, there's a difference between a person and their behavior. Wow. Think about that. That's pretty good, right? I mean, there is a difference. What are the differences between you and your behavior? Well, you know, you're always you, you know, and the you that you are, is either a goodie or a baddie, I guess. I mean, some people may be inherently, you know, cruel or mean or something, maybe. You know, I could probably think of a couple that I think might be that way. But the majority of the people that I've ever met, you know, you know, maybe some of them were stupid. You know, I thought they were stupid, but I didn't think they were cruel. And I wouldn't be cruel to them Certainly because they were stupid or something. I would never be cruel to someone because they're stupid. I might be cruel to someone if they were doing something stupid to me or to somebody that I cared about, you know, but, you know, I don't know. A little bit of forgiveness would probably go a long way, you know, even in your own families, my family, you know, everything. You know, just recently I took a trip back to Cleveland you know, to visit my parents. My mom is kind of sick, you know, she's going through a thing. And uh, for a while there, she seemed like she was in pretty grave danger. So, you know, we were called to Cleveland to go visit and, you know, possibly, possibly say goodbye to my mom because, you know, that's the you know weird thing about going back home whenever I'm leaving. You know, I make sure I give everybody a good, strong kiss and a good, strong hug because you just never know if that's the last time I'm ever going to see them. You know, Uh, we live so far away. So um, we went back to Cleveland to see my mom. And Oh, you know, it was such a great thing to do. I guess I, I realize now more than ever before, you know, how much I really do miss uh, my hometown. You know, there's those moments where I'm glad I live where I live. I live far away, uh, kind of have my own life, my own thing going on uh, without the scrutiny of my family. You know, we just kind of exist and do whatever. But I got to say this last trip, 
back to Cleveland was probably different than any other trip I've taken back home. And uh, uh, if you've been listening to my podcast for any length of time, you know, probably uh, maybe I think I did like one or two full podcasts about my experiences going back to Cleveland, Ohio, where I was born and raised, Um, you know. My experiences haven't always been great, you know, but uh, this time around it was different. I think the tone was different because the situation with my mother was pretty dire. At least it seemed that way at the time. She's okay. She's, you know, stable and, you know, she's uh, plateaued. You know, she's okay. But, uh, you know, it was really kind of funny because a lot of the time with my family, um, especially like my immediate family. Oh, I guess my extended family too. Um, There tends to be at times, you know, drama. (laughs) Like for no reason, a lot of the time, you know, it doesn't need to be there. And I'm a pragmatist, okay? So I I don't like drama in my life. I I don't need it. I don't want it. And it's one of the good things about living far away is I don't have to deal with it, right? But going back to uh, town this time, there wasn't any drama, you know? And I realized that about halfway through the trip, like my brothers and my sister, now I used to have two, now I have one, um, you know, all the other times in the past that I visited, um, there wasn't any reason for us to really kind of like pull together. They might've been glad to see me and we would do a dinner and, Oh, it's good to see you. Okay. Goodbye everybody. See you in another year or two or something. But this time around, like there was a common uh, purpose that we were all kind of gathered there for. And, um, my wife and I being the ones who traveled the furthest to be there. But, um, It was really kind of amazing to me to see this group of people that normally there would be some, you know, bit of drama for some reason, you know, but this time around, this time, there wasn't any. We were able to kind of band together, you know, rally around my mother and my father, okay, and kind of like roll our sleeves up together and uh, get it done, you know, take care of business and get things straightened out and I gotta tell you it was absolutely beautiful I mean if I think about it enough it'll bring tears to my eyes it was that uh, full of love and respect and uh, serenity you know that that's a word I would use um, in fact it was kind of cool I'm going to tell you about uh, an experience that I had. I wasn't planning on talking about this today, but uh, here we are. But uh, it's kind of personal, you know. But uh, my wife and I wanted to go to visit my sister's grave. And uh, it was the first time that we were going to go to her grave and she would have a headstone. Because it took a long time for the people who made her headstone to finish the job and get it done so I told my wife I want to go see it you know I wanted to go to her grave and I want to see the, you know what kind of job they did see you know it's it's done you know and pay my respects and she wanted to go too because she had a relationship with my sister like separate from me okay like they were friends before my wife and I got together okay they were friends and so my wife had a lot of affection for my sister as well as me. And uh, so we both were going to go to the grave and my surviving sister, who we were staying with while we visited, uh, she wanted to go too. Okay, so it's going to be me, my sister and my wife. We're going to go to my other sister's grave. We're going to pay our respects. Well, Thanks to the, what, the uh, blessing, I guess, in this case, of technology, uh, my sister had kind of, like, 
contacted everybody and kind of said, hey, we're going to go to the grave. Do you guys want to go with us? So, you know, we show up at the cemetery, we find our grave. And then one by one, my other brothers and my dad and everybody starts showing up. My sister-in-law, you know, everybody starts showing up. So the next thing you know, we're all kind of standing around my sister's grave. We're all kind of like talking, uh, telling stories, you know, remembering things, kind of like picking on each other a little bit, um, you know, but having fellowship and like putting our arms around each other. And my father was telling us stories about when we were little and it just, it was like this really weird um, experience. I'm going to try to explain why I say that because it was like this, like it was one of those moments where the sun was kind of like starting to set. Okay. So the lighting in the cemetery was kind of like this golden, like glow. Um, it wasn't too hot or humid and it wasn't too cold. It was perfect. You could wear a coat and you could be standing there and there was a slight breeze and, uh, the fresh air and, um, you know, this gathering, this impromptu kind of spontaneous gathering of me, my wife, and the rest of my family, except for my mom, of course. Um, and we were just there together, you know, and I can't quite pinpoint why uh, it felt the way that it did to me, okay, to me. But uh, I guess part of me says, oh, it's because like the, the spirit of my sister who died was like there with us and she was making us feel content and happy rather than sad, you know? Like her spirit was there. Like when two or more of you gather in someone's name, you know, like it says in the Bible, like it says that in the Bible, right? When two or more people are gathered in God's name, he is there. Like he said that I am there. Well, maybe that's the case with all of us. Like we are made in God's image, right? So maybe, maybe when uh, you and someone else gather in remembrance of somebody who's not with you anymore, maybe, okay, that spirit, wherever they are, is called to that moment to be with you. And uh, I don't know, it really kind of felt like something was up when I was there, I gotta say. Uh, we did a lot of things on that trip, you know, a lot of food and a lot of travel, a lot of running around and saying hello to people and visiting. But the one thing that really stood out in my memory when the trip was over was that trip to the cemetery, you know? It was really kind of, uh, dare I say, like a spiritual event, you know? Um, it really felt that way. And I don't know why. You know, there wasn't a reason why. You know, it wasn't like the mood was particularly good or something. We just uh, were there together, you know. Um, what a thought. Like all the people oof, that loved this woman who died, you know, like uh, we didn't love her like a little bit, you know. We loved her a lot, like a lot, like all of us did. You know, my sister was a really really tiny lady. Um, she was really kind of funny. Like she had a good sense of humor. Like re she really did. And uh, it was one of the reasons why I think her and I got along so well. Like our whole lives, you know, we never hit a hit a bump in the road. Um, maybe a little towards the end, but that's a whole separate story. But, uh, you know, she was like uh, a funny person. And she liked to laugh and um, she was kind of like funny because she was critical of people and critical of situations. Like she would criticize things in a funny way. 
And, um, you know, we laughed. We laughed a lot, you know, which is the uh, strong foundation for any relationship, if you ask me. If you can laugh, especially if you can laugh at yourself, you know, which she could, um, you know, it makes for a pleasant uh, interaction, you know, not too stuffy. And, um, you know, each one of my brothers and my sister and my dad, my mom too, all of us, we all had our own separate relationship with her, you know, and, uh, you know, so we were all gathered around that space, you know, yeah, yeah, it's like, what, her grave, right? Like, uh, her mortal remains, there's, she's not there, you know, she's somewhere else, you know, that kind of thinking, like, you know, but I, I really do kind of feel, uh, I gotta say, when I, when I go back, I close my eyes, like right now, I'm sitting here in front of my microphone, I'm closing my eyes, I'm thinking about the mood, I think about the wind, I think about the smell of the grass and the flowers and the trees, uh, the sunlight being the way it was, uh, the sense of calm and peace that was over everybody and happy laughing and not laughing too much, but definitely not crying either, you know? And, uh, as long as I live, I think I will never forget that. I don't know what it means, you know? I don't know what it means. I, I'll think about it more, I'm sure. And uh, over the years, I'll probably come up with some kind of answer to that question of like, what did that all mean, you know? But uh, you could feel it, you know? It was palpable. At least for me, it was. And uh, it was quite an experience. I don't think I've ever had anything like that happen before, you know. Of course, it's also something to consider, I suppose. Okay, now that I'm sitting here talking to myself about this, like actually verbalizing it, right? Um, you know, it was the first time ever that my mom wasn't there. <laughs> you know, I never really kind of thought about that, you know. Every time that I've been with my brothers and sisters, like in the past, my mom was around and my dad, you know, this was the first time we gathered without her and it was okay. You know, it was okay. Maybe that's why it felt the way it did because my mother's spirit somehow had an effect. I, I don't know. You know, I, I believe in that kind of stuff. You know, I believe in ghosts. I believe it. I believe that there is a spiritual aspect to all this, that we only see the material things. But, you know, beyond this dimension, there are things happening. You know, there's much more to this than we see. And, you know, who knows? Because nobody knows for sure. You know, after we die, like what happens? Nobody knows. But... You know, you talk to people who've lost somebody that they love, that they loved very much, and they'll all tell you a story about some kind of interesting experience. You know, that, that love that we have for the people around us is energy, you know? And as we know from the laws of science, you know, energy cannot be destroyed. It can only change form, right? So like all that love that I had for my sister, right? Or that I have for my mom or my dad or my wife or whoever, you know, where does that love, where does that energy go when I die? It, it doesn't die, you know, it doesn't disappear. It, it changes form and it goes somewhere else. Like what would be the purpose of all that love, right? Think about that. Like if you're a mother who had a child and you love your child, like, what's the point of all that love? If it's just going to dissipate once one of you are no longer there, I don't believe that's what happens. I don't, okay? Uh, it makes much more sense to me that somehow, okay, that love that we have for those people, 
that are in our lives, you know, the people that we know intimately, brothers and sisters and parents, grandchildren, children, nephews and nieces, you know, these people that have been in your life, you know, for how many Christmases, how many Thanksgivings, you know, like decades of just get togethers and things that we do with each other, right? All that love, all that stuff, where does it go? It's got to go somewhere, right? Do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about that? All that love you had for your mom, you know, all that love you had for your wife or for your dad, you know, or for your brother, you know, uh, or for your niece. And then the love that you had for your niece, where does it go? When, the, when one of you is no longer present, that love, that energy has got to go somewhere. And uh, I don't know. I think I was feeling it. I think I was feeling it more than I ever have before. I guess I was also kind of feeling like a newfound uh, love, respect, and appreciation for my family. You know, um, and you know what? I'm just happy that that's the way the cookie crumbled, you know? Um, we came back and, uh, you know, I reflected on a lot of it and that, that's really what came to mind, you know? There was a lot of interesting things on this trip to Cleveland, I suppose, that I should probably talk about eventually, but, uh, just to, to name a couple more really quick. Um, I, you know, grew up out that way in Ohio on the north coast of Lake Erie. And, you know, Lake Erie is not like a little lake with little boats on it. Lake Erie is a great lake. So it's like an ocean. It's like a freshwater ocean. It has a high tide and a low tide and, you know, white cap waves and all that kind of stuff. And um, my wife and I grew up on that coast, spent a lot of time there as kids, you know, going to the beach, going to uh, Lake Erie and kind of hanging out for the, what the kids would do when we were young. And uh, so my wife and I decided to take this ride all the way down the coast of Lake Erie. And oh, it was such a wonderful day. I got to say, I forgot how much I really do love living on the North Coast and enough to make me consider the idea of maybe, maybe, someday, maybe moving back to Cleveland. Now, we're not going to move back to Cleveland. It's not going to happen. But maybe, okay, because I love my family and I miss them. I do. And because I love that lake so much. I love it, you know. Um, I grew up there. It's where I'm from. You know, it's, my roots are there. And, oh, man, you know, when you return back to your place of origin after you've been away for a really long time, you know, you kind of get that tug. You know, at least I do, you know. And, boy, was I getting it there. My wife and I would pull over. Uh, they have all these different like parks along the shoreline. So you drive for like a couple miles and then you can pull off into a little thing and they have like a little dock. You can walk out onto the water and get back in the car, drive down a couple more miles. And there's another little park you get out. And we just kind of did like a little tour, you know, and it was beautiful. Just me and my wife, just quiet, walking around it's our old stomping grounds a little bit and all that. Um, it was fantastic. And another weird thing that happened was on my flight back from Cleveland, okay, we're getting on the shuttle to go from like the car rental place to the airport. And this guy, this big dude, sits down like right in front of me. Okay, we're on the shuttle bus going to the airport, right? And uh, this guy's wearing a Cleveland Browns hat, okay? And you know, 
I mean, right? You know how much I love the Cleveland Browns. You know, right? If you're a happy innovator, you have to know. Well, anyway, I had watched the Browns game the previous day with my brothers and sister and family, and we had a good old time. We're actually with my mom, and we just had a good old time, you know, watching the Cleveland Browns win, which is amazing every time they win, you know? But this guy sitting down has this hat, so I say, hey, did you see that game yesterday? And he's like, oh yeah, I was there. You know, I went. went. Oh, you did? You got to go? Oh man, I'm so jealous. He's like, yeah, I used to play for the Cleveland Browns. (laughs) That's what he said. And I'm like, really? And he's like, oh yeah, I came back for a reunion. Like we were having like a former, you know, football player, NFL Browns, like, uh, banquet, like get together. They have it every year. And he's like, I flew in from Maui cause he lived in Maui and, uh, you know, he visited with all of his old teammates and I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. What's your name? And he said, his name was Dan Fike. And, you know, I was kind of like in a headspace where I was thinking about my family a lot. Okay. So it didn't come to me right away who he was, but he was so kind to my wife and I, he offered to give us like his card, like he had a football card, you know, and he was going to sign it for us and everything. And I was like, you know, oh, you know, you don't have to do that. Or, you know, you don't, don't worry about that. It's okay. You don't have to do that. You know? And he's like, I only have three cards left or something. No, no, no. You just keep them. Give them to someone else. But I was trying to think like Dan Fike, why does that sound so familiar? You know, well, it turns out like, oh, Dan Fike, I know who he is. He played for the Browns back when Bernie Kosar was the quarterback back in the 90s, you know, and uh, I know who he is, but I just had forgotten. And he was wearing a mask. OK, so he had a covid mask, uh, you know, over his face. So I couldn't really see his face. But this dude was huge. I mean, it was, it's amazing. You know, when a normal average dude like me stands next to, a, you know, a guy who's big enough and strong enough to play in the NFL, it's like I'm like dwarfed by this guy, you know, but he was so gracious and so kind. And uh, I just thought that was really weird. Like, I, I, you know, you just never know, I guess, when you sit down on a bus or on a train or in a plane or whatever, you just never know who you're going to sit down next to. You know, there's something kind of uh, interesting and exhilarating, I guess, about that kind of randomness, you know? And uh, I don't know. I thought it was worth mentioning. I thought it was pretty cool, you know? So I guess I've probably done enough blathering. (laughs) Yeah, I've been going for a while now. Uh, The cork comes off, you know, when I start talking sometimes, especially when I haven't talked in a while. It's like, uh, like I said, the cork comes off and you guys get all of it, you know, but uh, I'll put the cork back on, you know, I put it back on and, uh, you know, I'll let you go and let you kind of get on with your day on with your weekend or whatever your week. And, um, you know, I don't know, I guess. Yeah, that's it. You'll be hearing from me soon. We've got some new music coming. The, The final song the final installment for the wrench and the Rubicon track number 11 is on its way. I have just finished today that song. So it's done as of today and you will be getting it very soon. So uh, stay tuned, have fun. And you know what? Thanks for hearing me out today. Thank you very much. Peace out, everybody. Have fun. Be safe. Behave yourselves. And remember, folks, If you want to keep what you've got, you've got to give it away. Talk to you later.
Okay, all you happy innovators that were kind enough and considerate enough and interested enough to stick around uh, to the end of the podcast for some music. Got a song for you. It's a song from my debut album. It was called Five Station Five. And uh, uh, this is one of the only songs I've ever done where I remember absolutely every single element of this song. I remember making it. I remember what the what the weather was like. I remember uh, what I ate for dinner that night. I mean, I remember everything about this song. Um, and it was really kind of, uh, actually, it was, it was made at a pretty dark time for me uh, in my life. Pretty depressing and sad time. And I think you can kind of hear that in the music as a reflection of that in there. But I also think that it was like a hope you know, there's a sense of hope in the lyrics and that what I'm kind of saying. I'll, I'll let you listen to the song and see if you can figure it out. But check it out from the Pipe Choir debut album, uh, self-titled uh, Five Station Five. All right. Circa what? Uh, probably 2004, 2005, probably. All right. Peace out, everybody. Have fun. Be safe. Take care.